Hello and welcome to the Crisis Point Podcast. I'm Eric Sammons, your host and the editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started with today's podcast, just want to remind people to like and subscribe to the channel wherever you listen to it, wherever you watch it. Uh, I really appreciate that and let other people know about it. Also, I just want to bring up, uh, I, I appreciate people consider donating to Crisis Magazine, uh, www.crisismagazine.com slash donate. Uh, we accept all types of payment, including even cryptocurrency. So uh, however you want to donate to us, we do appreciate it. it. helps us keep doing what we're doing. So today I have a great guest. I have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Anthony Esselin. He is a contributing editor to Crisis, but that's probably the, the least amount of, uh, of what he is. He's a professor and writer in residence at Magdalen College of Liberal Arts. He's the author of many books, of which we'll probably bring up a few today. One of my favorites is 10 Ways to Destroy the Imagination of Your Child. Uh, that was written a number of years ago, but I really enjoy that one. Uh, his most recent, I think, is In the Beginning Was the Word, an annotated reading of the prologue of John, which I am currently reading. I uh, hope to have, maybe have a review of that at some point at Crisis. I also have to mention that he is my wife's favorite author which my kids think is funny since I'm also an author, but they, he, she makes it very clear she's always loved uh, Dr. Esselin's work. So well, welcome to the program. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. So what we want to talk about today is the idea of culture, uh, restoring culture, restoring specifically Catholic culture. I know America is not a Catholic country, but we do have some Catholic cultural artifacts, I think, uh, within us. And we want to talk about what it means to restore that culture. How do we go about doing that practically? But I think in general, let's talk first about just what do we mean by when we talk about culture? And that sounds very highfalutin to some people and stuff. But what do we really mean when we talk about building a culture? What are we trying to do when we, we talk about a culture? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm a... Uh... I'm a great fan of a couple of authors in the mid 20th century who were uh, pointing the way towards this uh, problem that now, which is that the the very thing itself, culture, um, is shriveling. It's 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 fading away. Um, others I have in mind: Catholic authors, Father Romano Guardini, and uh, the French philosopher Gabriel Marcel. Uh, they uh, they saw in the offing after World War II, and not that long after World War II either, that, um, that uh, the, the true thing, culture, was being replaced by mass, what Gabriel Mars, mass society, right? Um, so people by the millions watching the same, listening to radio programs, watching the same television programs, reading news sources from only a couple of different venues, right? Uh, and Reuters and AP, um, and uh, uh, while well, losing the the very human thing itself, culture, and I think that they were onto something. I think that they were right. Uh, Joseph Pieper talks in much the same way about the modern world as a world of culture or vanishing culture. Um, if if you if you um, go back to to the word that gives rise to the word cultura in Latin. We're talking about tilling a field, you know, uh, carefully tending to the soil, right? Um, because you want something to grow from it. Uh, you, you don't want to just uh, use it, abuse it, and then move on to something else. It, it, involves, it involves a lot of care. And this is intergenerational. I mean, you don't just say, all right, we're going to do this, and then we're going to move on. Um, culture takes into account the distance and looks forward to the future right it, it, so if you don't have if i can put it this way uh, uh and i had this way many of my writings right i mean if if you are this strange people that the world has never seen before or your children are not singing the songs that their grandfathers and grandmothers sang you've got a problem okay um if they're not reciting by heart the poems which were also songs that their grandparents recited then something's very odd here okay this is a, this is the outlier in in human history this has never really been the case before even before a, a people would have writing 
songs and poems, which would be passed down from generation to generation. And almost all of that is gone now. Uh, the, the, the musical heritage is gone. The poetic heritage is gone. Uh, most of the arts are, are, are gone. They've, they've uh, established little niches for themselves in the academy, which is poison, or, or in the, the art industry, like the art museum industry. Um, but really, uh, it's not a thing of the people, um, which it always had been. Uh, and uh, there were basic cultural things that we are not getting done at all. Uh, for, forgetting about arts and literature, we don't even manage to get the boys and girls together um, to uh, enjoy each other's company and then to get married. We're not even doing that. I mean, we're failing at the, the fundamental human task of survival beyond uh, care. That is to uh, get children and to have those children thrive because inheriting from you um, good habits of life uh, they're 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 getting married young. They're having don't even manage to do that, um, and uh, that uh, well, I would say that make, makes us unique in the history of man, um, a uniquely colossal and inhuman failure. It it is interesting because you touch that touches on all aspects of society really because it touches on obviously the arts. It touches on schools, it touches on families, touches on communities, on parishes, all these different things. Because I think about like my own upbringing and, you know, I, I feel indicted a little bit, rightly so, because, you know, I grew up, I, I went to public schools. I, I didn't live near where my grandparents lived. We'd go visit them once or twice a year and maybe hear a few stories. Didn't really know my upbringing that well. My, my, my whole family grew up in the South and I grew up north of the Mason Dixon line, didn't really know other than some jokes about, oh, I was on the wrong, we're on the wrong side now, but that's about it. But I don't really know my own culture because it, it, it's like, I just went to public schools, learned the facts and that was it. And, and it seems like though, what you're really saying is that culture, the way it's passed on, it seems more like by osmosis than uh, somebody standing up there and telling you this is your culture, right? It, the, the most fundamental thing about it is that it's lived. Um, hold on for a second as I pick up a book. Okay. Sometimes I, um, uh, when people challenge me and they say, you know, uh, you, you're really talking about something that's quite elite, right? Uh, I say, no, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm talking about uh, what is in um, ordinary human experience, okay? And then I pick up, for instance, uh, one of my bound volumes of the Century magazine uh, from the late 19th century and early 20th century. Popular magazine in the United States. All-purpose magazine. Uh, serialized novels by Mark Twain appear in it. If you want Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and you want to read it before it gets to the library in a book form, you get the Century Magazine, right? Huckleberry Finn, excerpts from Huckleberry Finn, printed in the Century Magazine. So there's a magazine for everybody, right? I, I get random, and I find articles on science, on religion, on poetry, on art, on music, on American history, on world history, talks with Napoleon, um, Paris, uh, uh, the Giant Indians of Tierra del Fuego in South America. Uh, article on Oliver Cromwell. Uh, article composer Meyerbeer talks with Napoleon again. Um, uh, a short story and so forth. Things are in this. And I will bet that uh, this magazine, which, uh, um, okay, the most popular magazine in the United States at the time, would be difficult for most uh, college graduates to read now. Wow. Okay? If you were a 14-year-old boy and you wanted to read the next excerpt of Huckleberry Finn, this is where you went, okay? But college graduates would find it difficult going. Um, not just because the vocabulary is taxing, uh, but because there's a whole wealth of general knowledge 
that the authors just take for granted. I mean, they take for granted that you know a lot of things. Um, that and they don't take for granted that you've learned them in school. They, they take for granted that you've learned them just from living, uh, from living, from occasionally poking your nose into a book or a newspaper. Um, and uh, you know, John, almost all of that is gone. Um, and what's more poignant still, I find it also in the in these magazines, is their description of a, a common human life, right? That is filled with things that uh, seem to come to us from a different universe, okay? Um, but are 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 deeply cultural things, and as you say, they're not things that you learn in school. Right, they're part of the lived habits of the people. They bind the people together, such as we are not bound now. So, for instance, there's an article in here by the urban reformer Jacob Reese. Um, he wrote the book about how the other half lives. Right, uh, and it's about winter, a midwinter in New York City in Men. Um, part of it describes. Uh, you know, the tough life that you have if you live in one of the tenements and the danger, right? Because people have coal stoves or wood stoves. There's always danger of fire in the winter, and that's a terrible thing. But on the other hand, he just what these people did for fun when it snowed in New York. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, uh, all night long, all night long, kids and young people would be outdoors, sometimes with their elders, too sledding or tobogganing down one of the hills in Manhattan or coasting on ice, and a slide of, of ice and on the road. And it really is all through the night because he says, uh, there you'll see the strong youth of America uh, well into um, well into the daylight hours. So, so they, they're on a good snowy night, all night, long and into the early morning okay and the policeman he said would wink or look the other way uh how, how is this even possible well it's possible because everybody for granted there are certain things you do and certain things you don't do and everybody also takes for granted that um life is to be lived together and not you know in a little house over here and a little house over there um there's a great deal of social trust here uh, entirely missing now. I mean, imagine you could have your child taken away from you if it was sledding down a, a road in the middle of the daytime without right. supervision. These kids were out all night and into the next morning. It, um, it's uh, yeah. So uh, so I mean, we've got we've got a lot of rebuilding to do. Um, what do you think? Was I, I'm the, not. Yeah. I just say, what do you think was the like? Kind of, what's the root cause? Because in in listening to you, I feel like that some finger has to be pointed at just simply the development of technology in the sense of like, for example, you know, highways and cars and the suburbs and the spreading out and the ability to communicate without being actually physically close together, communicate at least the basic information. Because I, I just use my own example. We moved away. Uh, my parents, I say, moved away before I was born, away from home, uh, hundreds of miles away because right. they could just drive you know, back if they wanted to. But really, that happened maybe twice a year. And then just, you know, living out in the suburbs, uh, the, the neighborhoods that most people live in, you don't really have that close a connection. Uh, technology with like television and mass communications, you sit at home in front of the blue screen all day. I'm just kind of thinking of all these things as you're talking that are those some of the root causes and I mean, it makes it sound like Luddites, I know, but it just seems like that that did, those things didn't really help uh, keep the culture. No, they, um, in large part, they, they, they did not help. They presented certain opportunities, um, but they also presented uh, certain dangers, right? So we had this, uh, I've now come around to the opinion that it is a wonderful new art form to film, uh, the motion picture. For 30 years in the United States, it had a golden age, the coinciding with the age of the self-imposed code, okay? From 1935 to about 1965. Um, 
movies that are real works of art and wholesome works of art, not decadent or diseased great works of art. Like, for instance, The Godfather um, are great works of art of a very decadent kind, I think. Um, but in any case, we had that. But uh, the, uh, people were not quite aware of how much of a threat it would end up being. Of uh, 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 something peculiar that's cultural. I was talking to my wife about this the other day. Back when uh, the black pitcher Satchel Paige, um, very late in his career, joined the Cleveland Indians. Um, because he'd been in the Negro Leagues, they finally broke the color barrier with Chief Vincent. So the Indians uh, signed um, Satchel Page and Larry Doby and a couple of other uh, players that had been barred from Major League Baseball before. If Page gets on the team, the, one of the first things asked by one of his teammates when he hears Satchel speak, when he hears his speaking voice, is hey Satch, can you sing? And Satch said, "Oh, well, of course I can sing. Um, would you like to sing? We're getting together a barbershop quartet." And Satch says, "Sure, I'd like that." They did, um, and this is not peculiar. This is the kind of thing that guys did. Uh, and these Cleveland Indians would before ball games at home go behind home plate when they had a little bit of time and serenades with their impromptu barbershop quartet songs okay that's can't see barry bonds doing that a completely different person no you can't see barry bonds that, uh, <laughs> but you can't see anybody doing that now because nobody knows any songs thing um but that was still it was still the case. The amazing thing is not um, that there was a group of guys there singing, but that the ball players would take a little bit of time out before a game uh, and do that. That that was a little bit of a surprise, but I'm not a surprise at all, right? If you said, "Hey, there are four guys over there and they sing together," you'd say, "Well, yeah, so um, let's do that." Now that would be something. Right, uh, the church should have been more aware of the dangers, and this is where I I, uh, I take some uh, the council fathers at Vatican II. Um, I read the Vatican II documents, and and uh, I see where they were somewhat aware of the unprecedented threats to human flourishing that the contemporary world posed. And yet the documents are pervaded with a kind of modern optimism. Right. And I don't think that optimism was at all justified. Um, the, the circumspection was justified and there was a lot of that in there. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like right at the time when, um, the 60s, when so many fundamental human things are either going to be lost or they're, they've been riddled with termites and nobody's been noticing how weak they have become and all at once they're going to collapse. Um, and the, the, the technology uh, has, has been, and we should have been more aware of it and should have been better prepared to uh that to meet its challenges to avoid it when it sh needed to be avoided um we were in we were cited by it and everybody was blindsided but now i don't think there's any excuse uh um we've had uh we've had a century of rapid technological change and uh you know it's the television has been around the years uh, no more excuses on, uh, on that score. And we should really know better. And we don't. Right. Catholic yeah, schools stick computer screens in front of school children. Yeah, I was, on a, yeah, I was uh, on a school board of like a, a, a small 
Catholic school years ago, elementary school. And I was a computer program at the time. And I remember they were like saying, hey, let's get uh, computer training to these kindergarten kids and first grade kids. And they looked at me like I would support them because I'm a computer programmer. I'm like, are you kidding me? I was just, they wanted to like stick these screens in front of like kindergarten kids. This is a Catholic school with pretty good Catholic school too. And they just didn't see it though. And this was 20 years ago. Even then I think they should you know, see it, but now it's like, do we really need want kids in front of screens more? And that's, they think that somehow that, because you still see it no, today. They, they should hardly be in front of screens at all. Um, when are they going to learn how to read a good book? Right. right? Or sing or play a musical instrument build a garage uh, or uh, dig a well or go fishing or uh, climb trees or, or get up a ball or anything human. Um, what, what, what possible advantage does the screen to, uh, to mere children, right. the threats, hmm. uh, the, the, the filthiest stuff imaginable is just a, uh, a typewritten word in one click away. It, when you read things from the 1960s and including the Vatican II documents, I almost f feel sorry for the optimism they had, that they had this great optimism that, and it was kind of weird because they're coming out of World War II, you'd think after all that evil being perpetrated, they would realize the human condition's not the greatest. But they yet they they had this optimism, and you can tell it is based upon this idea of technological advancement somehow brings about human advancement just automatically. That because we have better yeah. better technology now, we're going to go to the moon soon. All these things somehow that makes us as humans better. Well, like you said today, I don't see how people can associate those two things together anymore. No, I don't see how either. You know. The, the great technological advancement, I have to confess, uh, has been the computer, the microprocessor, and so on. Uh, otherwise, all of the great uh, lofty dreams of technological improvement that uh, were dreamed up in the in the '60s, none of them have come to pass. Um, right? We don't ha all have our own airplanes. Um, we are not setting up a colony on the moon or on Mars. Uh, it, I wonder whether the pace of technological advancement as regards physical objects, um, buildings and so forth, I wonder if that really is proceeding or if it has not got up um, outside of the computer and computer-like things. Where has right. been the great technological in, in in my lifetime right uh, since um you know in the last 60 years where where has it been and, and yet you know uh, worrying about whether human beings would be subordinated to the tools they were using those worries have been with us since the middle of the 19th century and you know wise people have constantly been saying listen you need to take stock of this, okay? It's things we shouldn't just think that these things happen automatically, and whatever they do, they do. We should not consider human beings to be um, uh, the the tail that the technological dog is wagging. Right? We should be in control of technology for purposes, for human purposes. And if it no longer serves the most human things, then we should not use it. We should get rid. Um, why would you want a tool that makes your life less happy than it was before or less human? And uh, these things, the church had the wherewithal to understand what's going on. And, um, well, largely uh, churchmen, too, are a product of their times. Now we are dealing with, uh, uh, I think, with church led by people who themselves are very thin culturally, right? right. Uh, and they, it, uh, them, for instance, about bringing beauty back to the lives of ordinary Catholics, eh, it's almost impossible. Um, right. What can you talk about? 
to 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 you know we we uh, at Magdalene College we try to introduce students or reintroduce them to uh, works that should be part of any you know any decently educated human being uh, or Catholics uh, uh, heritage part of their heritage right. Um, these things should be a, a matter of course, right? It should be a matter of course that they're conversant with the great poetry in their mother tongue, um, that they're uh, somewhat familiar with great works of art from the West, especially Christian works of art, uh, that they're somewhat familiar with uh, two, nearly 2,000 years of Christian hymnody. Um, but they're not. Um, so we try to we try to make up for that uh, for that. Uh, deficiency um, that should be energetically uh, trying to make up for that deficiency or to rebuild after the world has been reduced to, to sticks and rubble. Um, but it, it, it's, it's nearly impossible to talk to people because they'll immediately get nervous and they'll say, well, you're an elitist, which is to miss the point entirely. And they, uh, well, partly they get nervous because nobody likes to be shown up. I mean, nobody likes to be told, you know, he had a lot. You know, there's all these perfectly ordinary human things that you don't know how to do. Because nobody knows how to do them. Because that's, you know. Uh, I have had to learn so many things in the artificial way, right? Uh, after the fact. Which is part of my life when I was a kid growing up and we weren't. What now let's talk practically a little bit how we can obviously none of us are going to completely restore the culture of the world on our own. But what can an individual like a family, what can we do practically parents who are listening uh, just or individuals that to, to help start the process? I mean, obviously, sending to a college like Magdalen College sounds like a great option. But even before that, in the home, yeah, what can you know? Because remember, the parents aren't educated. Either, like you just said, none of us are. And so what can the parent, let's say a, a Catholic family do to who probably goes to a parish that let's just say is culturally thin as well? And, and what can they do to right. try to restore culture, at least in their own families? Uh Okay, we can take this in a number of directions, right? Um, so just scatter shot off the top of my head. Um, go outside, okay? Things outside. Uh, get dirty outside. Grow garden. Uh, cut trees down. Climb trees. Build a hut. Do things outdoors, okay? Get food outdoors. Live a human life outdoors. Do it with as many people as possible, right? Get together. The, let the kids go outdoors. Throw them outdoors. <laughs> Stay. Tell them you have to come back in until supper time. Get lost. Go do something. Okay. Read good, good books. Uh, they don't have to be the the the, the highest classics. I'm uh, get John Senior's list of the thousand good books, and he said good books, not great books. Some of them are great books. But he put them on the list because they're good for the soul, um, and they should be part of people's heritage. Right? Get uh, start reading good books. Um, you don't know how to play a musical instrument? Learn how to play one. Uh, you don't know how to sing? Learn to sing. Uh, sing together. Um, get get together a uh, group who like to sing. Right? Do things. Um, get away from what whatever is as much as you can, all right? In the parish, hey, you know what? It would be nice if it would be nice if you hymns. And, uh, and if you sang the authentic texts of the hymns instead of editorially mutilated, um, it's usually embarrassingly and stupidly so, uh, versions of the hymns that are in gather, and worship for, and glory and praise, and, and hymns are us. Call them generally hymns are us. Um, the, the, even the so called even the traditional hymns, what few managed to survive in them, have been mangled. All right, they 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 sometimes they're almost unrecognizable, but they've been mangled. 
you know, sing the real, sing the real stuff. Um, get get rid of the slop and bring back, bring back real hymns, and those include folk hymns, because what has been passed along as as folk hymns in uh, Catholic churches in English speaking countries in my lifetime, folk music, that's show tune music from for off off Broadway musical or something. There's not folk music. You want folk? Go to the old hymnals. Old hymnals are full of folk music. Okay, um, they're full of Bach and men. Mendelssohn and Bach and Mendelssohn and Brahms themselves are full of folk music, and they're also full of, full of music that's directly from the folk without Bach and Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn and Brahms. Good, let me start to do that. Um, there's, I mean, there's so much. I suppose I, I, I was attentive about saying get up together reading groups in your parishes because uh, there are more fundamental on even than that. Here's one thing that is desperately needed in every single parish in this country, every single one. The boys and the girls do not enjoy each other's company anymore. And there's for that because uh, what they have seen by the time they're 13 or 14 years old has scorched their soul. All right. And they are taught uh, to be wary of one another, to think of one another as liars, manipulators, predators. This is utterly unhealthy, okay? They're, don't think when they grow up, they'll go out on dates. They're not going to do that. Nobody does that. Um, that's not happening, okay? Every single thing needs to see to it that the young people, the boys and the girls, have wholesome ways of enjoying each company, one sex with the other sex, okay? specifically as boys and specifically as girls not just indiscriminate teenagers but as boys and just we where are the dances okay um yeah if you let's suppose you're a teenager in the year 1960 before everything falls off the edge of a cliff right um you're 17 year old boy there's a 17 year old girl uh she's just moved into town and she's very pretty and you would like with her okay uh what can you ask her to do you can ask her to do all kinds of things first of all it's no big deal for you to ask her because everybody does that everybody expects it everybody does it okay it's just a common expected thing so you do so what do you uh where do you go well you could go play miniature golf or bowling um you could go see a show and it won't won't be foul, right? You can go see a movie, or you can go to a dance. You can listen to concerts. There are all kinds of things in all kinds of places. Almost all of that is gone, right? I mean, a little town, little town. Uh, as late as the mid seventies, my little podunk town in whole country of Penny would still have dances, um, at, at least one every week during and the spring the early autumn uh and things had already gone south by then right but they were things they were a lot healthier 15 years 20 years before um where are they all right nobody knows that and that's just a, a one single feature of of this tremendous fact which nobody in any capacity that i've seen in our church seems to have any awareness of um, that there is absolutely nothing help uh, for an ordinary teenage boy and teenage girl to do with one another. And so they don't. And this, this means that if they, um, if they obey the moral law, they are lonely. Okay. And if, I don't even want to talk about that um, because um, the things that, common now are almost unspeakable right. um so what what and what have the church has done what have the church done to provide wholesome ways of getting the young people comfortable with one another as the sexes and getting them married we've done almost nothing I, right it, i'm talking about fun things yeah. i'm not talking about marriage preparation yeah which is kind of like orthodontics i'm talking about <laughs> fun and I, 
it sounds though to me like in today's culture, at least today's society, one of the probably the best ways to do that is through homeschooling groups because it just because like you know my, my, we homeschool and uh, we want at one point when we homeschool we lived in an area where there was almost no other homeschoolers and it was tough. I mean it was tough for the kids because like you said there was just no opportunities for activities. But at the same time we didn't feel comfortable putting them in a public school where there were plenty of activities and they were all awful. And so it's like, okay, well, we had to right. choose between those two bad options. And fortunately, we live now where there's more opportunities. But I think that seems to be one path forward is for homeschooling communities to hold these dances, hold various uh, some ways for people to get together. I mean, unfortunately, you can't just send them out to the movies because no. most of the movies are trash uh, or, or whatever. No, not now. No, not now. Well, parishes right um they should be key players in this they really think about what we used to have there used to be c the cyo right catholic youth organization and there was cyo basketball that was coast to coast right is everywhere uh the first basketball court in my little coal mining town was not uh built by the public school it was built by the parish um father comerford a hundred years ago with family money built a three-story parish hall okay he was thinking right i i need the gainers something wholesome and interesting and fun to do that doesn't involve okay Thirsty coal miners after 10 hours of work down the down underneath are, uh, you know, prone to get drunk. Uh, so he built a three-story parish hall. There was a billiards room, right? Um, there was a reading room, the small library. There were meeting rooms for hour, okay? And on the third floor, a, a basketball court, and a theater stage with curtain and lights so that up there you could put on plays or concerts or you have a dance or you could play basketball okay and the public high school across the street had the free use of that basketball court for their for their students because they didn't have one of them. um now, uh, obviously, parishes, I, I suppose, can't afford to do that now. And Father Comer, with his own money, his family money. Uh, but the idea is, right, let's get the people together doing ordinary things that people do. Get them for doing them in a wholesome way, right? right? Nothing in the parish hall had specifically a religious nature. A pool, um, but it is a brilliant conception. Um, our, there, there, there ought to be, uh, there ought to be uh, concerts and dances, and ice cream socials, and uh, ways for the boys and the girls to each other. Um, as boys, as girls, and get people married, to have uh, young people have fun, having fun. And uh, that's, I mean, if we're not doing that, uh, the reading crime and punishment <laughs> is not quite, you know, I'm not, hey, let's all read Dostoevsky. I love Dostoevsky, yeah. <laughs> the greatest novelist to ever uh heard Charles Dickens, and, and yet, you know, no, I don't want everybody reading crime and punishment or the brother's car. Up, uh, or basement. Um, not before they've had ice cream socials and dances and concerts and, uh, you know, uh, all, all, all the human things which are not in place. I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with uh, Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict Option. And uh, I think there's some overlap here. I'm just kind of wondering your thoughts on that because I think his, his point's a little bit more political, I know, but it's the idea that we've lost the culture wars. 
just we need to admit that fact and then we rebuild the culture through these small communities is what you're saying similar to that or is there differences between kind of that idea of of seeing us losing the culture wars and and building up a community through like a saint benedict type way of these monastic communities not that we would be the monastic communities but you know what i mean something like that that helps build the culture yeah yeah i i think there's a lot of overlap he wrote his book at the same time that i wrote out of the ashes rebuilding american culture and, and uh archbishop chapu wrote um and uh, there's there's a there's a lot of overlap and i've talked to uh, uh rod about these things we had a conference about just this subject that that our touchstone magazine conference a few years ago uh i he understands that we're not talking about separatism right um understands too that these are things that have to be done in a community okay um about a family here a family there or even a little tiny group of families here and a little tiny group there we're talking about something bigger than that uh, I, I sometimes call them outposts of sanity okay we can call them some fun too um uh eventually what you want is that pe people from the uh world right um the world of a world that really doesn't even pr pretend anymore to have anything great to recommend it okay um a world where nobody even pretends that everybody has a lot of ordinary human fun um, I mean, even Disney is grim and sour yeah. and bitter. You know, they'll say, hey, you know, uh, we're missing something human here. Uh, I, I, I think uh, so I do needs to be done in communities. And this is why the parish is so important. The parish is sort of a, a ready-made doll. Okay. Um, it, uh, it's got the land. It's got a building. It's got a reason for people coming together regularly, getting to know each other. It's a, there, it's a lot of fun little things are there that can be worked up, right? Um, the one thing, uh, the one thing that I say, and I think Rod would agree with this, uh, uh, with, is that it's not so much that we've lost the culture as that. Um, that uh, we have um, we have lost, but there is no culture against which we're fighting. There's a monstrosity there that goes sometimes by the name of a culture, but it isn't real culture. It is a monster, but it doesn't make anybody happy. It does make a lot of people rich. It does make some certain people, but it doesn't make anybody happy. Um, and in that regard, we're not fighting against some, we're fighting against a great big nothing, uh, a great big vacuity and emptiness, um, rubble. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so presents to, to us an unprecedented opportunity back in the old days when you went to evangelize people they had a pagan culture and you had to uh strive with that also presented you things to to work with because every culture would possess some measure of truth and beauty um now the thing over there had really nothing to offer because it is nothing it's a great big monstrous nothing um which gives us a so bit of an advantage in that it's, it's we can harder. yeah i was just gonna say it, it gives us a bit sorry, of an advantage. Just, there's nothing to, yeah i was gonna say there's nothing to fight against in the sense that there's nothing attractive about what's going on right now so if we pre actually present something attractive which is probably what's so frustrating, I think, yeah. about how the church presents herself today. It protect, presents herself in the least attractive way possible, almost. 
And so, but if we, if we really present ourselves in the most attractive way, it is something that people will be attracted to because I mean, our competition is like you said, this monster is nothing. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So at our school, Magdalene College, right? Uh, all of the students participate um, in the choir. All of them are always up there singing. All, all students participate uh, to a large degree, so are really central to the to the whole thing. Okay, so um, uh, uh, a week or so before Christmas, about. 40 or 50 of the students came down in front of my house here in town um, and sang for us Advent and Christmas, Advent hymns and Christmas carols, okay? And um, fascinating thing happened. Uh, we've got new neighbors on one side of us here. We haven't really met them yet. Strange, okay? Because in a normal human culture, you'd have met them like the next day, right. but we're not normal. Um, they, uh, uh, I think they're on the political left, at least their bumper stickers suggest it. And uh, there are people across the street uh, don't seem to have any particular religion at all. Uh, these, there's these kids, they're singing and they're singing in harmony, right? Boys and girls, uh, young men and women singing in four part harmony, um, sometimes singing polyphonically. And it is immensely attractive. People are attracted to it before they even think, oh, gee, what's the ideology here? They don't even think that. They're attracted to it because it's normal, it's, it's human. And people stopped. Um, they, if they were walking past, they stopped or they came, came out door because they heard it and they stood out in the cold and they listened to it. They didn't know any of the kids. They listened to it. It's like, holy cow, how about that? I only saw that in it once. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's, I think that's a perfect uh, you example can multiply of that by 100. Right. And if our parishes are presenting beauty and obviously our homes and things like that, those things are attractive to people. And like you said, it's not a matter of thinking first of what's the ideology behind it. They're like, this is just beautiful. I'm attracted to it. I think it's neat. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah and, and and fun. Um, if your parish is big enough, uh, if your parish is big enough, and it, uh, of course, it, I wouldn't have to add that qualifier because there were so many kids uh, that it would matter if you had a small parish. There should be so many kids. But together, a couple of baseball teams and, and play each other every week or so during the summer. Get up, pick up baseball games, um, and don't be don't be embarrassed to say, uh, you know what, this, this is for the boys. Okay, don't be embarrassed to say that. There's no need to be embarrassed. Uh, some things you can get together. Some things only, and then some things bring them together. Um, they and and as the more public these things, the better. Then people look at them and they say, "I, you know what? I don't know what the, the, the they're drinking over there at that table, but I want to serve me some of what they're drinking." Okay, uh, and, and somebody will say, "Oh, you know, you don't want to be around with those Catholics. They believe this. They believe this. The person might might ultimately say, "Listen, I don't, I, I don't even care what they believe right now. Right now, I don't know what they believe. I don't care what believe they believe. But I see this. They're having fun." Um, <laughs> They're doing something interesting. Holy cow, it looks like those those young people. I haven't seen a boy and a girl holding hands in 15 years. And look, there it is over there. I don't know what they're drinking. Give me some of it. Right. Okay. Um, I, I think, and yeah, I was going to say, we say, you know, we've got some special wine. <laughs> I think, though, like what I see in a lot of parishes, I see this, there's a, a parish nearby like this that's pretty large. It has lots of activities, but it doesn't seem to be doing at all what you're saying. What I mean by that is the people I know, who I, it's not my parish, but I know some, I have some friends who go there. They're just overscheduled with lots of different, you know, they have their soccer meets, they, you know, and they have like a, a, a soccer, they actually have a gymnasium. They actually have a uh, soccer field and things like that. 
but it just seems like what happens is the kid, the, the families are just so busy. They're just going from this to that to that. And it, they're just almost like running around like chickens with their head cut off to do all these things. And it's a lot of it's through the parish. Yeah. So obviously that's good, but that's not, that doesn't seem to be what you're saying. So what's the difference between over scheduling and just doing all these and having lots of activities and kind of the, 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 the life, the, the life of the parish that you're talking about? You know, the best thing about a lot of this is uh, that um, it, it doesn't need to involve signing up. Um, these, if Once these things are well established, they go on and you show up if you feel like it, right? Um, you just show up. Uh, Back in the old days, um, when there were lots of kids and you had a little league in town, um, people would just show up to watch the game. They didn't even have to have a kid there. They say, "Well, there's a game over there. I'm going to take a peek and just sit down and what's going on." Um, if uh, um, if it's a sort of regular on a Sunday afternoon in the summer. Um, that you have a, a, a ball game right, in the field. Well, um, that's, you know, again, that this is not something that necessarily has to, you have to commit to. Uh, we do too much of that, okay? Uh, much of what I'm about needs to be established and tended at first, but when it's healthy, has a life of its own, right? Uh, and you would just say to yourself, "Hey, you know, I don't have anything to do. Let's go. On, let's go on over to hear the music at the church this afternoon, right? Because right? there, um, you know, uh, uh, there's this girl I like. Um, I'd like to ask her to do something fun with me. What can I do? Well, you know, um, uh, there's uh, the church is having ice cream." Um, Just... Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I'll do that, right? Um, it, it's tough to get them started, but when they're healthy, they go on and it's not official in any way. You know, it's not a duty. Right. It's there, like a bowling alley. <laughs> right. <laughs> so many of these things are gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Where's the bowling um, alley? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's. I, I think that's the, the idea of. It's not these scheduled activities that we're breaking up our days with, but just like, okay, let's go find. Let's just have there's th things to do, um, and you can choose to do them things or choose to not do. to do yeah. them. Yeah, um, I, we're gonna. And we're we getting. Need to, we need. To, we we need to be more deliberate about this at first, uh, but that the kind of deliberation is in large part artificial right. uh it's necessary but once things are established in a healthy way, don't need that anymore it becomes more natural i think we're gonna uh, wrap it up here pretty soon but i just wanted to uh, one more question i just wanted to ask was when if you're a fa catholic family you go to your parish and you want to implement some of this stuff at your parish this is the, the tough question. How do you go about doing it? How do you approach the pastor to, to say, you know, obviously he doesn't want more work to do. Uh, how do you approach a parish to say, hey, let's do this or, or that? What's what's kind of the best way how to get started moving in this direction? You got me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm no great organizer and I could never organize anything. I can hardly organize my day. Um <laughs> I suppose uh, you you might go to say, Father, uh, the young people don't have anything healthy to do. Um, we ha have a bell here. Um, how about a dance? Well, uh, nobody knows how to dance. Well, let's get together uh, somebody who knows about dancing. Old fashioned styles of dance and uh you know 
maybe we can uh, have some fun, not just dancing, but learning how to dance. Um, what about it, Father? And, uh, you know, once he decides that the insurance company will allow it, <laughs> that there's another problem, um, yeah, right. then, uh, you know, go for it. Go for it. Um, That's a great way gosh, to start. I mean, I mean just even just learning so how to dance and things like that. I don't know how to dance. I don't. Yeah, I, I I definitely don't. My my kids have been done some. Uh, they they had a dance, some dance lesson classes at like Franciscan University of Steubenville. I know, and they did some dances there, which was you know that was right. nice. And, and they've learned some. I think those are good, but I think even earlier than college age would be nice at, at the high school age and things like that. Oh gosh, you should be learning that stuff when you're seven or eight years old. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nobody I mean, really, does those. So. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I think well, I mean, it should be. It's another one of the things that happens naturally in a healthy culture. Nobody has to right. say, "Oh, let's uh, let's plan on this." It just happens, right? You know, you didn't take square dance classes uh, right. in Tennessee. You just grew up learning. Yeah, you just yeah, everybody did it. Yeah. Well, let's before we go, I want to ask you to let us know how we can find out about your books. Is, is there a particular book that came out recently you want to promote or uh, just how we can find out and, and get, obviously go to Crisis Magazine? Uh, I just want to make a note real quick. One of the most popular pages on the Crisis Magazine website is the author page, your author page on there. Like We get more hits on that page than almost anything really? else. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. I guess when they search oh, on no, you, that must be where they go. So. Um, but yeah, so how can people find oh, out? Oh gosh, though, well I didn't know stuff? that. Yeah. Uh, I'd I'd like people to check out Magdalen College of the Liberal Arts, uh, both for uh, sending your young people here. Um, a wonderful place, and it's quite healthy in all the ways that I've been describing, right? Uh, uh, or to if you don't have uh, young people who are of college age, to really strongly consider. Uh, donating to us instead of to your um, alma mater or your mater ferox. Um, I mean, why why shut money um, to uh, such places as usually gets the money? Right? We, um, we could use the support uh, and we use the your prayer and students. And as for my books, well, there's, well, the, the book that you meant is out and available. Uh, a, a running commentary on the first 18 verses of the gun, which Catholics used to hear at the end of every Mass, uh, the so-called last gospel. But for, um, for a rebuilding culture, uh, this is one salvo of mine in, in that. It's a, uh, the, the book of, uh, it's a single poem, which is a book of poems, a hundred poems called The Hundredfold. And if you're afraid of poetry, don't worry. Uh, I write in traditional meters, and I, there are 40 pages of an introduction to explain how to read a poem. Um, Very good. Again, the sort of thing that you didn't have to do in the old days, just as you didn't have to teach young people how to dance because they picked it up when they were growing up. But you do have to teach people how to do that now. And you do have to teach people what a poem is now, and I, so I do this. Um, and there are these are all centered upon the life of Christ, okay? Um, and uh, um, I really have meant it as, uh, uh, you know, getting it out there saying, hey, fellow Christian Catholics, we, uh, we need to take back um, this portion of culture, too, because it, too, has been reduced to rubble. It's, it's been abandoned. Well, let's take it back. Poetry, I mean. Okay, let's take right. it back. The universal uh, human art. No culture is without it except for us. Right. I'll uh, I'll make sure I link to Magdalen College and Out of the Ashes and the Hundredfold. I know my wife has read the Hundredfold. We have that here somewhere, but I haven't. So now I'm encouraged to because I admit I'm not a poetry guy. So now. I'm going to be, I'm encouraged to actually pick uh, it up, will, especially, to, will, especially the part where you said it explains how to read poetry. That's what I, that's the part I need. <laughs> oh, 
oh yeah, I teach you what it's what's going on. And uh, to, uh, to whet your appetite even a little bit more, 12 of the poems are dramatic monologues spoken by some character uh, in the time of Christ or shortly after, okay? Uh, so, for instance, um, what would St. Peter say to himself on that fateful night when he denied Christ? After, after the cock crowed and he wept bitterly, what's Peter thinking? Well, that's one of the... Or, or wow. one of the monologues, or the, um, that blind man Bartimaeus, after he's been given his sight, what would he say? Um, or, or uh, imagine that boy who had the low, the, the the couple of fishes, when Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes. Now he's a grandfather, and he's telling his grandsons about what happened what would he say okay that sounds intriguing uh, what does that band say uh or mary G joseph has passed away jesus has not begun history yet it's early in the morning he's asleep and she's looking at him and she's still thinking a sword shall her heart she's thinking about him and she worries what does she say to herself Sounds very good. Sounds sounds uh, excellent. I can't wait to pick so, it up now. <laughs> okay. Wait, well, You'll thank have to tell you. me what you think. Yes, I will. I I'm sure I'm I'm sure my wife loved it, so I'll have to figure out. You know, I'll have to pick it up now. So, very good. Well, we're gonna uh, end here, and I, I appreciate the time, and hopefully some practical tips for people. Uh, and I think it's a, a very important. It's kind of the underlying. You know, we talk about a crisis, all the different issues going on, and we try to give minor things. But this is like the, the current underneath it that, that's kind of pushing everything. And so this is how we, we, we kind of dig a little deeper into the current and try to maybe change the course of the current more rather than just the things on, that are floating on the top, which is what we normally deal with. So, okay. Well, great. Thank you very much. And uh, until next time, everybody, God love you.